Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to Inspire Me Forward. Welcome to our ninth episode. And I think we do this sort of as spring comes. It just feels, I'm just feeling like it's exciting to move forward. And we've got three wonderful guests this month. And our guest today is Taylor Beckett. And with our ninth episode, I got to... I always find something just comes to me beforehand to sort of open our our episode up with. And I thought number nine, the number nine kept coming to me. So I thought I would uh, just share. I looked up number nine and I thought I would just share what this this piece said about number nine. And it said, this number is a humanitarian at heart, it is compassionate, kind and intent on putting its efforts toward the creating the greatest good. The number nine in numerology has gone through its fair share of hardship and is wiser, stronger, and more aware as a result. And those firsthand experiences make it especially understanding of others who are struggling and willing to provide valuable support. So I thought, after Taylor and I had talked before, that I think that fits. So there's always something that, that jumps in and goes, here I am. And Taylor, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Uh, so I'm Taylor Beckett. I'm the owner of Silver Willow Farm. Um, I, I gave a, a little spiel on who I was in an intro video that we shared, so I won't go over all of that. But uh, basically, I, I'm just uh, someone who, who my life has not been very linear. It's gone in all sorts of different directions. And one of the things that I'm I'm very grateful about myself is that when life spins me, I tend to land on my feet again. But it doesn't always feel like that's going to happen when I'm in the middle of it. And that same um, thing that is such a gift that I can always land on my feet is also something that um, can sometimes trap me in really bad situations for a long time because I just I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Even though I'm I'm not fine. Um, and so, yeah, that was uh, the sort of what I wanted to talk about today, where I was at 15 years ago, or 15 years ago, sorry, where I was at in 2015, seven years ago, and um, what got me out of that situation. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I've had the, the pleasure of visiting your Silver, Silver Willow Farm, and um, such a beautiful place and such such a healing place, so... I can see how you, over the years, how how that has helped. I'm sure, and I'm sure that will come up in your conversation. How that has that land, the land and the animals have really. They're yeah. a gift. Yeah, not... absolutely, absolutely. And and I think in your, you know, we you and I have talked before this in our conversation. It's really the leaps of faith are, are so individual. They're just. Yeah. I think when I started this, it's like a leap of faith. Here's the box. Here's the leap of faith. We all do them. And then as I've as it's evolved and we've talked to more and more folks, it's been, oh, they're each they're each individual as to where they're going, but they're each individual as to where they've come from and how they've come from. Yeah. And leaps are different heights and different widths, and they take different lengths of time. And yeah, I think when you and I chatted, it really just opened that door for me in that perspective of leaps of faith are just as I said before, as individual as snowflakes and yeah. where we're going to and where we're coming from is, is also different. And we, but what, what I think is not the same, but similar is the wisdom we get out of it and what we yeah. learn and, and coming up to number nine here and on we go is uh, starting to see the trends for want of a better word, but the similarities in the wisdom that we we hear and we learn and and um, one that comes to me always is life's check check boxes and we grow up and life has check boxes we're supposed to check them off and the leaps of faith are jumping out of those text boxes they're those tech you know check boxes and things so I I very much look forward to holding space for you and sitting with you and I am going to give the floor over to you now for you to share your journey so I, I I think the best way to start is where I was at in 2015 so um by the end of the year uh I've been battling an undiagnosed autoimmune disease since 2011 
I weighed 119 pounds. Um, right now I'm sitting around 150, maybe 160, and I'm not overweight. So you can imagine how unhealthy I was at 119. Um, I was in chronic pain. I, I couldn't walk more than 10 steps without having to um, like sit down on the ground. And I'm doing all of this while I'm trying to run a farm. And at the same time, I was in a, a very toxic relationship. Um, very unhealthy relationship but because of the nature of the relationship and the way that trauma bonds work I thought that if I left I couldn't do it anymore I couldn't run the farm I was so sick that I thought there's no way there's no way if I'm by myself I can I can make this farm work um I thought that I was the problem and that I I was the issue uh, and I had lost, completely lost touch with who I was and um, my sense of self. So leading up to 2015, I also started on um, a path of healing with the horses. And I, I it started with uh, my horses actually demanding during riding lessons, they would start doing the emotional work with people. And I didn't have a say in the matter. The person would get on the horse, I'm thinking, I'm going to do a regular riding lesson. You're going to walk in a circle, trot in a circle, we'll work on position. And the person would just start sobbing. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, I'm crying. I don't know what's wrong with me. I did I just... And what I... The horses were bringing it out in the people. And the horses were demanding that I step into that role of, of facilitator and helping. But I had no idea how to do it. I hadn't really done therapy. I definitely wasn't doing my own personal work. And that's why I was in that toxic relationship. And so I found Horse Spirit Connections. And I, when I went there, um, my first job I went to, I sat down and we're doing the circle and they say, introduce yourself. And I said, hi, my name's Taylor Beckett and I don't share. <laughs> that, was, that was what Wendy had to deal with as her introduction to me. Um, and then I started bawling <laughs> and my mom was there with me and my mom's going, I don't know what happens. She doesn't cry. She hasn't cried. She, she's five years old. I don't know why. She, I don't know what's wrong. So, um, it just sort of launched me onto that. And so that started my journey into doing the sweat lodges at, at Horse Spirit Connections, uh, women's circles, um, and, and just slowly figuring out who I was. I, I did a year with the, the ICSS. And all of that started unpacking things. And I started realizing that, that as the more I stepped into my power, the more toxic that relationship became. Because mm. for that, I had to be small. And as I started realizing that, I started thinking, well, maybe I can just hold my boundaries differently. Maybe I can, because I still... To me, ending a relationship and ending a marriage was a failure, and I don't fail. And so having to negotiate that part of it as well was uh, was very difficult. But I just kept persevering. So that's 2011 to 2015. Then by the end of 2015, um, something happened that I couldn't um, ignore, and I couldn't allow myself to be in a relationship where that had Mm -hmm. And I did say I'm ending it. And mm -hmm. even at the moment, I thought I just needed a break. I thought I just we'll just take a, a break a month or two apart and then we'll we'll see what happens. And what I realized in that first month is that my energy was coming back. Mm -hmm. Um I was able to keep the progress moving forward instead of working really hard, doing the growth work and still not moving anywhere because you're getting pulled back into that, that sort of lower vibration and toxicity. And so after a month, I, I said, no, do you know what? I'm not going back. And I told my mom and uh, it was actually pretty funny because I, I always knew that my mom didn't like my ex a lot, but she tried very hard. And knowing my mother, you have to know how hard it is for her to hold her tongue. And, tried very hard to hold her tongue and when I said to her I'm not going back she goes are you sure you're not going back I said no I'm, I'm sure like this is done she goes no like are you absolutely sure like you're definitely not going back I said no I've realized that it was really unhealthy I have to get out of this I'm done and she goes okay 
he was uh and beep 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 and she just said I you know 13 years of of anger and and that and it made me realize how when we're in those toxic relationships it's not just hurting us it's hurting all the people that love us mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. um and so that was that first leap of of faith for me was was saying that regardless of if I lose the farm, regardless of if I can't look after the animals, regardless of any of that, I matter enough not to go back. Mm -hmm. My mental mattered enough not to go back. And that, um, yeah, that, that there's, there's sometimes these things that we think are holding us, um, that are helping us and necessary, that we need to let them go in order to be healthy. And so going back a little bit more, so um, I had originally, uh, the, the initial separation, when it was just possibly a temporary, was at the end of November. The following week, I lost my job uh, because of my autoimmune disease. I wasn't capable of working full time. And my boss wanted a full time employee and, and wasn't open to accommodation. So I, I lost my job there. And then I found out, of course, who I had had. Uh, since I was 17, and this is something that needed to be put down. Mm. So it was a very, uh, it was a very, very rough week to put it. What a week. <laughs> it was, it was a bad week. And so to my horse, I said, look, like, I get it, but I need a month. Like, you, you got to find a way to pull yourself together for a month, and I will book it for the beginning of January, but you got to, you got to hold off because I can't, like, I'm, I can't. And he did. He he straightened himself up and was like, "Okay, well, but you book it. <laughs> like you book the appointment because this is this is it." And so that first week, um, while I was out, I when I say I got into a deep, deep depression, uh, and that's what got me into the Rockies. I only got out of bed to feed the animals. I get out, do the bare minimum of chores, go back, lie in bed, and doom scroll on Facebook. And that went on for three or four days. And again, the type of person I am, I think I'm like, this is not okay. I'm always okay. This is not okay that I'm not okay. I gotta, I gotta get moving, but I couldn't get myself motivated. And I kept seeing this stallion and two mares popping up in my Facebook feed that were for sale. Mm. And they were in um, the Oral Medante area. Mm -hmm. And I thought, but, well, I'm going to go out because it, it just kept popping up randomly of uh, different sites and different places. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to drive out to see them. I'm obviously going to buy these things because I'm, I'm not set up for a stallion and I cannot take on extra work. And uh, But it's going to get me out of bed and it's going to get me out. It's a couple hours drive. It's going to get me moving. So I showed up at the farm and tried out the mares and one of the mares after I arrived just walked up and placed her head on my chest and leaned in yeah right <laughs> and so the person I was buying it from just sort of looked at me funny and she goes we don't take her halter off because we can't catch her <laughs> and I'm like oh well that's me like now I need to get these horses so I went and uh, and I said, I've got this opportunity. I said, these Rocky Mountain foals are worth thousands of dollars as soon as they're born. We can get these ones for really cheap because they just pick them up at an auction. We can get the papers. Are you willing to invest in this with me? And to be perfectly honest, I think my mom was just happy to see me out of the bed because she had um, And so the both of us went out. We went on a trail ride with them. The stallion was riding with the mares. They were amazing. And so we bought them. And and so again, like looking at, at why I was even there is because I was in such a deep depression that I was just trying to find something to reset me with no mm -hmm. intention down that road. Um, so now fast forward to the beginning of 2016. Uh, my first horse, I've, I've put him down. I've made the decision not to go back to my ex. And I've got uh, a stallion and two mares that I had, you know, I've never bred horses. I've never raised horses. 
Um, and here I am now with two mares and a stallion on the farm, along with all of my other my other menagerie. <laughs> so that sort of started and, and kickstarted the journey. Um, and what I really wanted to talk about today is that that leap of faith, as much as that that jump uh, got me out of the situation, that's when the work really began. That's when mm -hmm. I really had packing all of the things that I had had um, packed up and repressed to myself over the last uh, 13 years within that relationship. And so during that process, like I can remember at one point, um, like I'm, I must have looked like a lunatic. I was in the grocery store and I bought groceries and I bought the penny pasta and I got to the, um, I got to the counter and I put the penny down and then I, I realized that I don't like penny pasta. I bought penne pasta because it made sure that there wasn't a fight at home. I liked to buy shell pasta. And it seems like such a stupid little thing, but it was, it was to me just the, the realization of how much of myself I just kept throwing away, little things, throwing away, because it's like, I don't want the fight. I don't want the drama. And the problem with, with really unhealthy relationships like that, where, where there's that level of toxicity, is that if you keep giving yourself away, it's never going to be enough because the issue isn't you. And the issue was never you. Mm -hmm. The issue you're, you're dealing with someone else's trauma or someone else's pain or someone else's um, mental health issues. And if you keep giving yourself up to keep the peace, thinking that that'll work, no amount of love, no amount of, com of compassion, no amount of compromise will ever actually fix that. Yeah. And so I ended up, looking at the the, clerk, uh, the the woman at the register and I said, I don't like penne pasta. I like shell pasta. I'm going to go get shell pasta. I'm like, this is why I'm like a lunatic and I'm walking through the store. Going, I like shell pasta. Why would I have even bought the penne pasta? I'm getting shell pasta. And I came back with like eight bags of pasta, like as much as I could carry. So I'm like, I'm eating shell pasta because that's what I like. And I threw it on the And that Thing just kept happening little things where I realized you know this is what I really like or this is this is who I really am and the sad part of of that healing process is that when you go through it the pendulum is swinging right mm. and it's far the other way and so during that process um I I reconnected with someone that I had met when I was 17 and I had lost contact with um, and when I was 17, you know how 17 year olds are, he was the love of my life, even though I knew him for three days at Woodstock. And so I reconnected with him, uh, through Facebook. I shared a picture and within 24 hours, we were in touch. Um, people like recognized him and just put us all in touch. And he lovely human being, one of the kindest human beings I've ever met. And I was awful to him. I was terrible. Mm -hmm. Because I was trying to take my power back and mm. I was taking didn't deserve it. And I look back on that now and it, there's no part of me that thinks that, you know, we would have worked or anything like that. But I look back on that and go, holy geez, when we're coming out of trauma, we have to be so mindful as we take back that power to find that line. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... Uh, I did reach out years later and apologize. I didn't get a response back and I really don't blame him because I, like, I was awful, absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. um, and then through that process as well, I'm sort of doing two tangents here. So let me know if my ADHD gets too out of control. <laughs> but okay. uh, I'm now having these these first foals born on the farm that mm -hmm. I've before and, and I wanted to do differently and I wanted them to be at liberty. And so I let them give birth in the field. I didn't halter them. I let them stay wild. And holy crap, I couldn't get near these foals. And I've got these giant 20 acre paddocks. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't touch these foals. Yeah. Maybe I. But I just trusted. I trusted, that, again, that leap of faith. I trusted my instincts that, that this is going to work. And I started watching the herd. And if you watch the herd, none of the horses were allowed near those foals either. The mother would be out there and the baby would play with the mum. The baby might play with the other baby. It might play with its auntie. 
but it's not going over and hanging out with any of the other horses on the farm. And so as I watched that, I started relaxing a bit going, okay, wait, it's not me. It's everything. It's everything. The baby is, is, is being protected from the world at this age. And so I started, um, just hanging out in the field, doing, you know, chores, doing the stuff you do. And then one day the baby came up and interacted with me. And so that, that trust in, in the process now is a huge part of how I raise my, my Rocky foals in that they are done at Liberty. The, the first probably four or five trims they get on their feet, they're not on the halter. They're just standing in the field. We pick up their feet. We do as much as they're comfortable with. And then they walk away and we work on their mom a bit. They come back, we do another leg. Yeah. And so in that process, while I was reclaiming my power, I was also um, learning how to work with the horses right from, from when they're a baby without taking away their power and finding mm -hmm. that, that balance. Um, that first year, uh, there was a lot of deaths. Uh, I had a lot of senior horses and I lost an animal, whether it was a horse or a goat or a belly pig or one of my dogs. It was just every single month there was something. And I was hosting women's circles at the farm um, with a, a really uh, very wise woman. I, I really respect her a lot. And I remember a, a horse died right before we were hosting circle. And so I disassociated so that I show on. Yeah. And and she said, are you sure you're good to go today? I said, oh, yeah, no, I've, I've just disassociated. Like, I was fully aware, but I've just disassociated, and I'll just work through it. No. And, you know, the deaths aren't going to stop until you stay in your body when they happen. Mm -hmm. That just that hit me in my heart so hard to yeah. think, like, Holy crap! That's an option. I can I can stay present in grief. Mm -hmm. And so when I what ended up uh, happening is I for that sh circle then I stepped back into my body, and it was a hard circle to host when you're actually sitting in yourself and you're feeling everything that needs feeling, and you're authentically being who you need to be. It was also one of the most powerful circles that we'd ever held because of that authenticity. Everyone could then was then invited in to be yeah. their authentic. Yeah. And and so um yeah that that first year coming out of it was just so much learn and heavy. It was like the universe is like, okay, you want to learn? These are all the things that you need to deal with that you haven't dealt with for the last 13 years. And it just kept throwing it and throwing it and throwing it. And the beauty of all that is where it ends up taking you. And mm -hmm. so eventually you become the person that you need and you become the person that, um, that can support you. Can, I did a ton of ch um, child healing work, the inner child work. And you, you realize that you become the person that you needed when you were a child. And that's actually the beauty of these toxic relationships is that you don't just heal what happened in the relationship when you start down that path of unraveling that much pain you start going way back and unraveling things that you didn't even think were an issue and you probably never would have dealt with if you hadn't have been put in a position to make you that wrong and so i started unwrapping stories that i told myself as a child stories other people had told me and unpacking all of it so that i could become who i truly am and who, who I truly want to be. And throughout that whole process as well, because I was terrified that I would lose the farm and how would I do all of that, this amazing community of people stepped up around me. And so I was, I was unemployed um, and wasn't qualifying for EI because of the nature of how I was laid off. And this girl that I had known for like, she came out to the farm like twice and she'd been brushing horses showed up one day with groceries and, yeah. like, oh, crap. and um, this amazing family bought a horse for me and they, they were helping me with mowing the lawn and fixing things up and taking care of things. And all of people are just stepping in and helping and supporting so that you have, you can build a proper foundation. 
Mm -hmm. And and they, what what ended up happening is I the by the end of that relationship, the house was burnt to the ground, mm -hmm. and and like the house being my my foundation of my relation of myself of who I am that was ground there was nothing left. But the beauty of that meant that instead of the rocky foundation that we all build in childhood, because um, I always joke, parent messes their kids up, they just hopefully give them the skills to unmess themselves as well. Because we're not we're not perfect, and, and we try our best with our kids. But we're dealing with a little life form that's not us. We're going to make mistakes, and so by having it brought right back to the rubble, I was able to build a foundation that's actually solid. And yeah. so as I'm in life now um there's an ability to sit in my emotions an ability to be present um an ability to recognize when i'm not when i am overwhelming and and still having because you know those are old neural pathways like it's they're they're not just going to be wiped clean and so when i'm falling back into the old patterns recognizing it and all of that ended up with me becoming the person that I needed, which then opened me up to be becoming, to be able, being able to find a relationship with someone who's yeah. at the same, who's also a whole person who's doing his work, who is trying to be his best version of himself and is holding himself accountable. And neither of us now are trying to fix or save the other person. We hold space for each other. We are there for each other, but we're not, sitting there trying to, to rescue each other. And it makes for such a healthy relationship. We used to joke when we were first together, we would say good for as long as it's good. And people mm -hmm. would say, well, is breaking up? Does that, does that mean you guys, it's like, you know, I'm not gonna try to change the other person into something they're not or change ourselves into something we're not to make it work. No. It's gonna work as long as it works for both of us. And if we grow in a way that it work with each other anymore, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. And so, yeah, I guess that sort of is the last summary of the last seven years of my life. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so, so I've got a few questions. Um, so can I add the, your article on grief? I just wanted to point out that because I think that is, does that, that ties into a lot of the, what you've been speaking of. So Taylor's got a beautiful article on grief so we'll make sure we post that in my equine leadership magazine so I, I think that when you're speaking of that I'm like yes I remember it and it's such a beautiful article and such a, a deep article so I think uh we'll, we'll definitely post that you spoke of power and you spoke of strength I'd love for you to maybe unravel that for us a bit as to what you're you know how how those sit with you? Are they the same? Are they different? You know, I'd love that. That's an interesting question. Are power and strength the same? So, so that's a really good question. Now and then I get them. Yeah. So <laughs> they are the same because, because I was always strong. It took strength. It took strength to stay in a toxic relationship. A weak person would have broken sooner. A weak person would have given up sooner. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of strength to stay in that. And that's that's actually one of the things I, I, I have a friend who's, whose parent is in a very abusive relationship. Um, the, the father is very, very unhealthy and the mother is, is, um, is staying within that relationship to her detriment. Um, when I met her and, and I said to them, um, your, your mother is one of the strongest people I've ever met. And they looked at me funny for a second. They said, I know, but everyone thinks that she's weak and stupid because she's staying. And I said, it's not, a weak person couldn't deal with that. Yeah. that a weak person would break. And so, um, so you can be, have all the strength in the world but mm -hmm. have given power away. And power to me is one, it can't be taken from you. You have to give it up. It's it's mm -hmm. not some uh when someone when someone says they took my power, you can't mm -hmm. have your have to give it up. Um mm -hmm. so power for me is 
is that um, that sense of self, that sense of who you are, uh, this <clears throat> the sense that your wants, needs, and desires are valid and worth it. Yeah. Um, and so that when I think of power, that's what I'm thinking of, of that I deserve to be in this world and I deserve to to have the things that bring me joy, provided I'm not taking, obviously, from someone else, but I deserve is yeah. sort of what I think of power. Yeah. And I say that it can only be taken from you is is that um people in, in horrific situations can hold on to self-respect. Yeah. Um, and then there are people who give their power away on a daily basis just to avoid a conflict and just to avoid a fight and just to keep the peace mm. and aren't substantial. So, so yeah, there's a big difference to me between power and strength. Now that you made me actually give that thought. That was a <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what I mean, what I'm hearing, what's what's coming to me there is that the strength is in a character. It's in, whereas the power is the heart, the self. Yeah. It, it sort of, yeah. sort of how it sort of, it, it's summarizing in my head and my heart might not. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's just like that strength in character. You say character and like, yeah, I can hold this, but do I want to hold this? Is it in my heart to hold this? It's good to hold this. <laughs> yeah. Really interesting. Um, and you said, and I, I, I love this. Is you said the beauty of a toxic relationship. Yeah, like that's not a lot of people can say that. And I guess I have, is, is that hindsight? Seven, yeah. So seven years of separation. Um, it's finally fully closed too. I just just finally this year finally got the final divorce through and everything. So I that does shift a lot for me. I don't know if I could have said that six months ago um, yeah. had that little tying me uh, yeah. but once the word was cut um yeah that was that was actually a big part of my healing um i had a, a party a celebration of the, the divorce and we called it a very a very merry unmarried day <laughs> <laughs> once everyone sort of went home and that i sat by the fire with uh, my boyfriend and a friend and I wrote a letter to my ex uh -huh. and I, I thanked him for all of the things mm. that I'm grateful for. And I, I, there wasn't a whole lot that I was grateful for in the sense of like good things, <laughs> mm. but, but a lot of good things came out of it. I learned what love wasn't and that, that's so that I can see what love actually is. I how to not give my power away because I had given it away and and that learning that I didn't need to do that is the reason that I can have a healthy relationship now because when there's when there's disagreement I can hold my power mm -hmm. while having discussions to find a compromise or to find out you know how mm -hmm. we move forward yeah 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 if you asked that six months ago I probably wouldn't have, have seen it that way Sure. But definitely, yeah, no, there was a lot of, in those terrible moments, you, you really find out who you are as a person. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want, I've got a note here about the horses, but I want to come back to that. Um, how did it feel to say the words like you said? You said the words to your mom, like this is done. How did that? How did that feel in the body? Do you, I'm, I know it was a while ago, but do you remember? And I know you sort of went up and down and and through different things. But how did that that moment just verbalizing those words? Terrifying. Okay. Terrifying. Um, because for me, again, that that at that point in my growth, that was a failure. Okay. That. Nice. Mm. how my mom responded how after her response this relief that oh my god she doesn't think that I'm a failure she doesn't think less of me oh, I hear you. yeah but I'm, and so um 
but the actual the actual act of saying it was really terrifying for me because I of all the judgment that I thought would be there with that and all the judgment I shouldn't even say the judgment I thought all the judgment I was doing to myself in that situation yeah. um and so the the relief didn't hit until I realized that not only was my mom okay with it but that she was um relieved and 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 like so like she's crying she's so relieved yeah yeah have to watch me be destroyed anymore she didn't have to watch um me become someone that I wasn't yeah. and and by the end of that relationship I was not myself anymore I I was a shell of who I was yeah, I hear you yeah yeah so that that judgment sounds like those check boxes it's like yeah you know judgmental check boxes that we have absolutely um I'll get a farm and eat rinse, rinse lather and repeat until end of day <laughs> um so let's let's stepping out of that um and i wrote down here like and, and you said is like like horses bring us human community that's what yeah. i wrote down here it's like it's it, and you said that and i just it does and i remember when we had the farm and it the horses brought humans together yes. and I, I, uh, and i see what you do at your place i'd love if you could just maybe speak more to that because it's just and then how you work with the horses oh if you could speak to how that that beautiful way that you just you see the horses in a different way yeah yeah so so I guess we'll start with that is is for me when I look at um any of the animals that I'm working with they're fully sen sentient like a, a lot of us when we look at our dog or our cat we see something that is there to make us happy, is there for us to pet, is there for us to cuddle, mm -hmm. and we feed them, so therefore, that's a fair trade. Mm -hmm. When I look at the animals on my farm, I, I see other, other family members in the sense of other community members. They have their own autonomy, um, which isn't to say, just like in any friendship, there are times when you say to your friend, no, we're doing this. But if you're always the one saying, no, we're doing this, then it's not a friendship. And so um, when when I hold circle, uh, so I, I used to host monthly with a, a woman named Dahlia. She's moved out to Calgary, which really sucks, but she's very happy. So good for her. Um, and so and now I host with uh, Jesse, a good friend of mine. And we tend to do it um, uh, quarterly, like we do it for the different souls ceremonies mm -hmm. so we do a combination of um work with the land with the energies of the earth the energies of the weather um and the, the animals and then we take it out to the field to the horses to integrate it even deeper mm -hmm. and so when we walk out to the field uh there's a couple ground rules that i always ask people so one is i tell them that when they first go out not to touch the horse not to talk to the horse and they're not allowed to take pictures and selfies and all of that because we want them in their body mm -hmm. and in and that way they can actually truly get the wisdom from the horses the reason we ask them horses is that one of the ways that um we as people bypass doing our own work is we distract ourselves with the other so um start petting on the horse as a way to avoid the things that are coming up we start talking to distract ourselves from the the inner wisdom that we all carry mm -hmm. um, so i ask them not to touch or speak to them in the beginning mm -hmm. and then it, when once you've been out there for a bit and you're feeling into it then you can touch the horse if the horse mm -hmm. and having them really tune into their body. So just like you can tell when you approach a person, whether there's someone who want a hug or someone who doesn't, and not everyone picks up on those cues, yes. but it's lovely when people do. And when, cause I'm not a huge hugger mm -hmm. in, in general. I'm get I, I do, I do hug people, but I'm not one of those people that wants touch all the time. And so when I see someone who walks up to me and notices my body tense and they say, would you like a hug? My body will relax and I'll say yes and I'll love that hug. But if they just walk in and just go to hug me, I like it's like get off of me, don't touch me. I need space. 
that's why I feel like that with the horses is to see whether they want touch, how they want touch, where they want touch. And then the the work with the horses is really inspiring and magical. And and for people who are not so much in the woo-woo, because I'm I'm in the woo-woo land, um, magic and all of that, it'll sound crazy what I describe, but it uh, if you come out and experience it, you'll see how real it is. The horses will communicate with you very directly on um, what you need to know and the wisdom that you need. And so got basic body cues, licking and chewing and pawing and things like that to help communicate. My horses will also, uh, they'll take a dump for, you know, letting things go, but they'll turn around and smell the, the poop or go find a pile of poop and smell it to call you out on your bullshit. And so if I say to people, if you find that there's, you know, they look you in the eye and they walk up and they smell a big pile of poop, be aware of what you were thinking because you were probably doing that that because of x y and z or i'm not enough or yeah. problem is insert whatever bullshit there is yeah. and they'll call you on that so the horses will communicate with people on these very deep powerful levels where um the like i i've had uh school teachers come out and they're struggling with how to maintain boundaries with the teenagers they're teaching mm -hmm. and a horse that is a teenager will walk up to them and start pushing their boundaries and teaching them how to hold firm without, you know, yeah. without all or raging out. And uh, so the horses will always, will always know what that person needs. And then for myself, I tend to, to try very hard to um, give the person the chance to develop their intuition on their own because the horse is talking, and anything that I interpret, I'm interpreting through my personal lens. Yeah. But I try to be neutral. We've we've got all of our own stories and wounds and joys and all of that. Project that out, whether whether we want to or not. I try to really help the person find the meaning that they're find from the horse. No. no. Um, and the only time I'll really step in is if the horse starts giving me this look, like this person is not getting it. You need to come and translate. And sure. I'll come over and say, hey, so what are you feeling right now? What's going on? What does this remind you of? And sort of take them down the path so that they can get them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounds um, that that by people honoring the horses, like you've asked them to honor them and not taking selfies, they're actually honoring themselves, but then they're better humans together. Yes. In the end, humans are better together. And, and that's the beauty of doing the circles versus the private work. I do love the private work and we can go deep. Like that's where it's one-on-one, -on -one, myself, a person and a horse. But the circles is where the real healing happens because you're hearing other people that are going through similar experiences. You're being held in that sacred space. Uh, so that sharing. And for some of these people, they've never shared in their life because they think similar to me. Hi, my name's Taylor. And I <laughs> Uh, they 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 they've never actually had a space where they can speak and there's no judgment and there's no uh fixing because that's one of the things that i'm a big advocate for when we're holding circle it's not a chance for everyone to jump in and say well you could do this or you should do that or you should do this it's holding that space so that the person can share and as they're talking and their heart starts to open up they can find that wisdom of and all I need to do is to fix it is this. And the look of surprise on their face when it comes out of their mouth. Like, and that oh. can't happen without that community. That community is what holds that space to allow that person to go deep, um, to see that they're not alone in mm -hmm. whatever thing, and for other people to um, share what they're going through. And, and, and as they're working through their problem, the person, because for whatever reason, like you were saying at the start, that uh, there's always trends there's always themes mm -hmm. it's always amazing to me that when people sit down at circle and you say what's your intention for the circle today this theme always emerges where everyone's going through something very similar and <laughs> yeah and yeah. yeah how did how did it happen that everybody was drawn to come to that circle and have the same yeah absolutely magic yeah. it's magic and <laughs> yeah 
every month and and i love those people because they are so committed to their growth like when you go every single month you see growth absolutely absolutely but then I, i see such a beautiful um as you're talking here um reflection or I, I i use the phrase share it forward but you, what you've gone through and now you're it's this non-linear but this beautiful cycle that uh, yeah I say, I say thank you but i try to think it's coming from everybody that's just like you've taken what and you're sharing it with others and it's beautiful so yeah, yeah you, go ahead <laughs> Like the, that actually just, just recently I helped a friend, um, get out of a, a, a similar sort of relationship. And, and the reason I was able to help is that as she's going through, cause the, the stages of unraveling a trauma bond are always the same because it's an addiction. Yeah. It, it's literally got the same response on your brain as any addiction does. And so she would call me and be like, I, I don't know why, but my brain won't stop just thinking of the good times. And I logically know that, you know, this was broken and this was this, but I still want to, I still keep remembering the good times. And it's, that's cool. That's a trauma bond. That's normal. What's your experience? And so to walk someone through it because you've been through it and not just from the clinical side, but from the actual, like you've experienced it then I, I could help make sure that she didn't end up going back and didn't end up falling and and that she could process them a hell of a lot quicker than I was able to. Um, and actually, Pat, Pat who is, is in on this call, is a huge... Like, I, I don't know that I ever have realized what the, the problem was or what was going on if it wasn't for Pat. And she actually, she remembers this because for me, it was huge. And she said, you know, have you ever read the book Becoming the Narcissist's Nightmare? And I said, uh, no. And she goes, I think you should. And she gave a link to it and it was an audio book and I would listen to it as I was driving. And the realization that what had occurred to me is just a formula. It's just, it's just something that happens is sadly common. Yeah. and that how to get out of it and so because of this book she gave me it taught me how to handle the separation of that uh relationship because it's obviously complicated when you have a farm and land and animals yeah. thank god no kids but and so the book gave all the tools i needed to do it and if it wasn't for pat mm-hmm. i don't think i ever would have fully understood what it was that had happened to me and and of what happened to me is part of what allows me one to heal but two to help people who are either currently in a relationship like that have just left a relationship like that or trying to heal after that kind of relationship yeah. and yeah if it wasn't wow. for pat thank you pat <laughs> <laughs> um so we're i was watching cognizant of our time here one thing i wanted to just just and I think it was you that said this to me because of the different animals you had on the farm, but it was the sounds the animals make. And I, I think that was you that the that people are attracted like a, um, like a cow will be like a a soft like a moo like was that you that talked about the sound, but definitely I find the different animals help with different things. So the horses help very much with the. Uh, working through emotions and big emotions. Yeah. Cow, an absolute gift for calming you when you're anxious. They are this grounding, calming, amazingly, they, they're just such a gift when you're having anxiety. The sheep and the goats help you laugh. Like they're just ridiculous um fun little animals that that remind you to play and bring joy into your life mm-hmm. so definitely sounds i've never that wasn't me but the, whoever said that to you is very right <laughs> <laughs> but they do. that's interesting that that they do have those different gifts yeah interesting 
Oh, this has been such a rich conversation. I will use the word rich because it's just so, so beautiful. Um, let's get into our wisdom. So we always ask for three. Uh, there's been so much wisdom already, but if we could, if you can pull it into three pieces of wisdom for those that are watching this now, what might, what might those be? So the first one is to listen to your body's whispers, because if you don't, it'll turn into a two by four. And I have no symptoms for my autoimmune now that I'm happy. And yeah. that's extremely powerful. So I do believe that the the symptoms of my dis, my disease, my disorder were very much the the stop sign of soul my my body being like we will not allow you to go any further down this and if you try we will literally put you in a hospital bed and not let you get up to pee so yeah listen to those whispers so now when i feel like a, a twinge starting i'm like oh i'm pushing myself too hard i'm a little overwhelmed i need some self-care uh the other one was sometimes the things we think we can't live without or is what's slowing sorry let me try that again sometimes can't live without or what is slowly killing us and so I I think that if you are suffering from um, autoimmune depression anxiety I don't believe that any of those things happen without cause mm -hmm. I just times what the cause is is something we don't even want to acknowledge and that's part of why they've spiraled as big as they have mm -hmm. And the last one is no matter how broken you think you are through community, accountability, and hard work, you can become whole again. Mm. That was a beautiful one. And so true. And so true. You've just, you've, you've been bought, like body, that's not the word, but you've just brought that forward in so depth, in such depth today. Oh, Wow. Um, okay, then we always start finish with a call to action. So if you had uh, just a call to action for those that are watching and listening to this, it's like if there was something you say, just if there's one thing you do in the next 24 hours, what might that be? Or 48 or however. <laughs> Honestly, if you're in an unhealthy relationship, whether that's in or, or friend, but if you are in something that is toxic to you, and that doesn't mean the other person is toxic, if it is toxic to you, walk away, mm -hmm. walk away. That's, that's if I could say that, that would be the main advice I have because I, I really do, life is way too short to be miserable, way too short <clears throat> and way too short to be angry. And we just need to give ourselves permission that we don't need to keep toxic people in our life, regardless of what the past connection was. We, we owe it to ourselves to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's true self-care, is it not? Self-care that really matters. The rest of it is just uh, window dressing. Well, exactly. I can go to the spa, but that is... That is uh, that heart-based self-care, which I found when I left my job. It was, and it wasn't toxic, but for me it was. And it was, oh, well, I could go to the spot. No, self-care is sitting with it and letting each story go one at a time and, and gratitude like you did, like you did there. And just all of those pieces, that's self-care. So thank you for uh, thank you for sharing that today with us because and thank you for all of this. Wow, I am I am I'm gonna say I'm honored. I feel blessed that you felt that this is a space that you could share all that and and share it with everybody because I know there's gonna be so many people that hear this and go, I can do it because part of this whole thing is showing pe showing other human beings that they're not alone. Yeah. And you've really said that today. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, everybody, for being here and listening and sharing um, our next 
Inspire Me Forward number 10 will be on the 16th with uh, Lee Hodgins. And then we've got Fotini Shandrika um, at the end of the month. And then we're going to have three or four of them in June. So we are just rocking forward. And this is the first of our fifth month. And we're just moving forward, inspiring along the way. So as my father say, my late father said, inspiration is a door um, and may it ever be open. May we always keep it open. I found that just when I started this series and it was in some of his old art books and he's been gone since 2018, gone, but never gone. And uh, I found that just before we started and that's like, thanks dad. So may we ever keep that door of inspiration open. Thank you, Taylor, for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Like this space is so needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay put. And I'm just going to. Where's my book?